Thanks for coming back. I appreciate you. And it is Dr. Mitchell, correct? Doctor, you got your PhD. I want to honor that. Uh, last time you didn't come in, you were on your anniversary. So happy anniversary. <laughs> happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Thank happy you. anniversary. How many years? 20 something you said? 18, okay. 18 years legally uh, recognized, 24 in October together. Wow. Okay. Look, look at that. Legally recognized. I like it all. I like it all. Well, thank you. And congratulations uh, on, on the uh, longevity of it all. You know, uh, relationships are weird today. Um, I could not, I don't understand all of the swiping that people do. And it's just, it, it just feels like it's very exhausting. And then you add in a pandemic and monkeypox, and it's just like, what's the point? Why? Oh Why my goodness. This? Yeah, I'll admit that, you know, that's part of what is nice and to be celebrated in being in a long term relationship, uh, not having to navigate those things. But I'll say that part of what is clear to me is how much you have to make the relationship on purpose. And I think that that's something that we've done really well. Like, I'm very clear that we choose each other every day. I don't think there's anything natural about monogamy, which is something that I talk with my students about. There's nothing natural about monogamy. You have to choose it every day. And so doing that on purpose has been a real gift for us. I am so glad. I didn't know where we were gonna go today. Um, I spent the weekend finishing up Peaky Blinders which I started several weeks ago. As people know, I watch a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. and I'm like, catch an episode on the bike, maybe, you know, <laughs> here or there in between all the other things, among the other things that I'm doing uh, or that I'm watching. And the sixth season I avoided because I knew that Helen McGorry, uh, who had passed away, wasn't going to be there, Aunt Polly. And so I got through season five and I was like, damn it do I do season six? Cause she's not there. And I was just like, but I'm glad I did. Cause it brought up several things that I wanted to talk about. Um, and art is a, I think an entry point because it's a common thing. I know a lot of people started the game of Thrones thing last night. I taped it. I'm not watching it yet, but I'm going to, and you know, it's a phenomenon Thrones y'all, you know, the, the prequel to game of Thrones kicked off on HBO last night. And, uh, you know, when you talk about monogamy, now, the Pinky Blinders are like a criminal enterprise headed up by Thomas Shelby. And it's England and the right after World War One, Thomas Shelby Shelby was a, a war veteran and a hero. And he comes back and he's a gypsy. Right? They come from this gypsy family and Pinky Blinders. They wear they put razor blades in their caps, their page boy caps their newsboy caps, and they will slice your ass up. They were the, the precursor oh. to the uh, five percenters. <laughs> I just, I'm just giving y'all references. But, okay. you know, uh, in this criminal family is this honor and this this kind of following of a certain moral edict, even though they're gypsies and they're, you know, they're they're nomads and they're 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 debaucherous and they're murderous. And they but they're, they have this this thing that they live by. And I was thinking about that because in this last season, I'm not going to give away too much. Thomas Shelby um, marries a woman who is by society standards, a prostitute, a former prostitute, but in their relationship, they have a real deep and abiding understanding of who each other is. And there's like, and he, he broke a vow, which wouldn't seem unusual in a, you know, a outlaw family. Mm -hmm. but it was too much but this woman was a prostitute but there's do you know what I'm saying like there's I feel like we're in a society now where there are no boundaries where people don't honor their word it's like there's room to not honor your word even if you're a sitting president there's room to lie and cheat there's room to be unfaithful in relationships and we seem to be readily acceptable accepted accepting of this behavior as mm -hmm. a society and I don't is it old-fashioned you know I love the issues that you're putting on the table because again this is stuff that I delve into with my students and classes start for me tomorrow so <laughs> this feels very perfect for the way that I want to complicate things for the young people in my life and so what 
your mapping out for me drives home something that I always try to make clear, which is that humans create culture by what is most commonly said and done. And that means that we make meaning, Karen. We make the meaning of our lives. What I want my students to understand is how you make that meaning and you can make it on purpose. So to be concrete, I don't wanna speak in you know abstract terms, to be really concrete about this, this is part of what I mean. Human ingenuity, human creativity can be used for destroying life or affirming life. There is literally nothing you can do that can't be used in both good and bad ways. So we have these ideas, for example, that um, domesticity, a home of one's own, is automatically a good thing. But the truth is the idea of domesticity and having a home of one's own that has stability and privacy, that concept can be used to steal life or to affirm it. That mm. idea is exactly what makes, for example, the sexual exploitation of girls possible. Well, that goes on in that house, mind your business. So let's be clear that literally anything humans do can be affirming or destructive. So that is the reason why I'm a firm believer in, I want to know my reasons for what I do, and I want to check and see if I like my reasons. So when I give you the example of my relationship, I'm admitting to you, there is no automatically good thing about monogamy. The question is, why am I doing it? And do I like my reasons for doing it? Because everything can be used for good or bad. Domesticity can be used as the shield that allows people to destroy the lives and self-esteem of girls and anybody who isn't a straight man. So let's be clear that it can all be good or bad. Mm. 866-801-8255. I'm giving out the number because I have a number of things I want to go over with Dr. Mitchell. That nothing to do with politics, a little bit. Um, you said that this is uh, you want to complicate the, the lives of your students. Ex explain what that because I, I start up uh, teaching on Thursday. OK. And each semester I come into it with this like I'm not I rip up my syllabus. Right. I know I have a guideline, but I'm like the world right now is in a very interesting place where if I'm teaching, whether it's talk radio or journalism, what I really should be digging into is the souls of these students and tapping into something inside of them to make them put their heads up and look mm -hmm. at the world and then make a decision about what it is that they're going to contribute. So that means I'm going to have to do something a little different than I might have done maybe 10 years ago. We're going to learn some basics, maybe, but we're going to have a lot of conversation. So when you talk about complicating their lot, what does that mean? Oh, what a beautiful question. Thank you. I mean, and first, let me just admit, I'm not as flexible as you sound. <laughs> I, I am definitely a type A, and I know that about myself, so I honor that about myself. <laughs> so there will be no ripping up of a syllabus in Dr. Mitchell's class. But what I mean by complicating, a, a, a perfect way for me to get at answering this beautiful question is to say that, you know, one of the lines in literature, I teach literature, as you know, one of the lines in literature that stuck with me throughout all these years of teaching is, um, you know, just because I love her doesn't take away any of her rights. That is Seely in the color purple talking about Suge, the love of her life. And what I do for my students is I say, let's think about what in your life has convinced you that if I love somebody, I get to take away their rights. They get to um, never again look at somebody else with a lustful eye. That feels right to us, doesn't it? That somehow they would have fewer rights because I love them. And so when I say that I try to complicate my students' understanding of things, that's an example of what I do is I say, we are all drenched in ideas, in discourses and practices, in words and deeds, 
We're drenched in them to the extent that we think they are just natural and right. And we don't even question that they were actually lessons learned. They were constructed in a society that had a very clear idea about who should be at the top, who's next, who's at the bottom, who can be used in ways that other people can't be used, who's a good woman, who's a bad woman that you can do anything to. Like we're all drenched in those ideas. And I just want to give us the power to notice what is it that is parading as if it is just a natural truth. It's parading as if it's natural to the extent that I don't even notice it moving. How can I equip my students to see just the contours of it moving? Because it's always moving in the world. But if I think it's just natural and right, like, I don't know, Adam and Eve, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, like that's a lesson learned. That's not a natural truth. So how can I equip us to see? Oh, wait, but, but Dr. Mitchell, the Bible says, Oh, please. Anything. <laughs> listen, again, wait, but, the Bible, the Bible is a book. Said... The Bible well, wait a is a minute. book. And wait a you minute. You know I love books, Karen. <laughs> you know I love books. But the Bible. <laughs> Anything that involves a human being writing it will involve some of their biases and their ideas about how certain people should be on the top and certain people should know their proper place on the bottom. So I mean, and the Bible is translated 500 million times. Like, come on now. I'm really going to give all my power of critical thinking over to a book written by <gasps> another human being who isn't any oh, better than me. Wait, pause. Dr. Mitchell's here. Y'all, uh, 866-801-8255, Dr. Caritha Mitchell. Uh, the book is from Slave Cabins to the White House. You should get that. Uh, we're having a conversation that I'm, I'm, I apologize for jumping in, but <laughs> as I'm... Mm, you because you're laying out some really heavy stuff it, it may not seem heavy it is really heavy though that I think we should sit in for a minute this notion of what I believe because I, I get into these um virtual battles because people are too cowardice to actually confront you personally like call up you don't agree call up let's have a oh you cut me off well because I'm I want to ask you questions like you're not going to give a dissertation and a soliloquy on these airwaves unchecked and a lot of things that people believe they think it's, it's a fact mm -hmm. and i was like that's your opinion it's not a fact well it's what i know based on what you but your limitation you don't it doesn't have any scholarship in it it just feels very like you didn't read anything it's just what you believe mm -hmm. doesn't make it true mm -hmm. that's that's hard I that's a hard place that like, okay, so you said, how do I complicate this for my students? What you just described is precisely what I'm going after in my class, right? Is that everything about our upbringing in this society has taught us that certain things are just the natural truth. And what I want to equip us to see is how it's not an actual truth. It's not a natural truth. Your idea of what is natural and right has been conditioned from the moment we come out of the womb. So if that weren't the case, then it wouldn't be so important, for example, to constantly drill into people's heads what girls like and should like, what boys like and should like. If it were a natural truth, it wouldn't have to be drilled so constantly. Even the idea that there are only two ways to be human in this world, female or male. All of the billions of people on the planet, and it makes sense that we would all fall into two categories, male and female, that doesn't actually make truth makes sense if you think about it, but we've been drenched in these ideas so relentlessly that we accept it as natural truth. So you're right. There's no question in my mind about the, the, the uphill battle before me as I try to complicate my students' understanding, but I am very invested in it because I see the power, the, the power that I see most of all in being human is in the power we have to create meaning. And I see that power because I see how much that power has been used to destroy life or to affirm it. And so I never want to have my students give up their power to be really, really clear about what is it that I'm accepting and why am I accepting it? Mm -hmm. Eight, uh, eight, six, six, eight, zero, one, eight, two, five, five. But the chromosomes, though, but the chromosomes. All right, Dr. Karika, ah! as you're talking, I'm also, you know, I often say I want to create the world. I'm, I, I want to create the world in which I, I want to live. Like I'm 
giving people the tools to create the world in which they want to live. I want to create the kind of world I want to live in. Uh, it requires something of us. It's not just going to happen. I, I'm very clear about that. Just yesterday, I'm sitting on my couch and somebody has the audacity to park in front of my door, blasting music. So I go out pretending to sweep. And then I'm, could you, excuse me, could you turn down the music? What? I'm like, could you, I'm trying to work here. Can you please turn down the music? And they looked at me like I was an alien, but I'm like, why is it okay for you to blast your music in the middle of the street, like in front of somebody's door? Why, why do you think that's acceptable behavior? And, you know, I gave them that look like, so they, they turned down the music and then they drove off. But I'm like, I could ignore that, I guess, and not get into a confrontation. Maybe that could have ended badly. But I don't want to live in a world where people, you know, violate the sanctity. And I know I'm not the only one that felt like that music was too loud. It wasn't, you know, Stevie Wonder, you know, was some, you know, (laughs) music that bothered me. Anyway, I say all of this to say, to your point, do you think many of us don't believe that we can create the world that we want to live in? Do you think people even think about it? Do you think people just accept what it is and they navigate it and move through it, but don't really stop to think, what can I do to change the trajectory of this thing here? Cause it's not working for me or for most of us. Oh, absolutely. I mean, everything about, and I'll just be specific to American culture because that's the culture I live in and know the best. Everything about United States culture um, teaches us to not examine ourselves or what we've been taught. Um, In fact, I would say that American culture encourages us to run away from self-examination. So have we actually thought about um, what it is that we think is meaningful or have we simply adopted what the church told us or what education has told us? And not examining that is exactly what U.S. education is all about. It wants to have people who conform and people who don't question. That is the reason why education has become all about memorization. That's why education has become all about, you know, kind of a, you put in, I spit out to you and then you regurgitate to me and that means that you get an A. No, critical thinking actually would require that you think about power dynamics and you think about where you sit within those power dynamics. So when you say that that, you know, building the world that I want to live in requires something of me, that hits home, right? That hits home because it requires me to actually examine myself and where I sit in this society and what have been my unearned advantages. That is the work that American culture encourages us not to do. And that's what I want to equip people to do. That to me is part of how we can Um, help to make the world that we're trying to live in is not to simply assume that we have everything figured out and we have no biases and no, you know, points of ignorance. Mm. I want to get to the biases and the points of ignorance in a second. So I'm in the Nubian chat and Rodlayer, Rodlayer, I think said, how do we determine what is the natural truth? How do we determine that? Well, I would argue that there is no natural truth. There's only the truth that you believe is natural. And the reason I say that though, okay, let me be very, very clear and concrete. The reason I say that is because we are human beings. Uh, We are not made of Teflon and somehow not affected by the words and deeds that shape our realities, the discourses and practices. None of us comes to being without being drenched in socialization and culture. So the words and deeds that you have been drenched in are what help you determine or what make you believe what is natural and right. But to your point earlier, Karen, what we believe and why we believe it has everything to do with the fact that we just have thought that thought over and over and over again. So people who have thought the thought over and over again and been reinforced by a society that makes them think it over and over again, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, then of course you're going to think that that's a natural truth. But that doesn't mean that it's a natural truth. It just means that you've been in a society that has been lorded over by people in power who have erased other truths. It's never been the case that other people didn't exist, that this two 
idea system of male and female, it's not as if that's always been the case, but we live in a society where the people with power create that. And so we're drenched in those kinds of ideas. And so at the end of the day, to my mind, what we want to be paying attention to is you can never, never have critical thinking if you're not also thinking about power. And part of what we have to start to understand, I think, is that power is not simply in some kind of stringent idea of politics, right? Politics itself is actually just the distribution of resources in every way. That's the reason why we can talk about the politics of respectability or the politics of beauty. There is a distribution of resources that happens when you're considered beautiful. There's a distribution of resources that happens when you're considered respectable. That is politics, a distribution of resources. So part of what I want us to understand about critical thinking is you cannot actually be thinking critically if you aren't thinking about the power of distribution. So if certain people are always getting to determine what is considered the thing that gets you um, access to resources, when certain people are always determining that, then that is power. And if you're ignoring that power differential, you're not actually thinking critically. So why is that linked to what I just said? What I'm saying is the idea that there are only two genders and that God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, that idea is linked to how our society has determined that it will distribute resources. So power differentials cannot be ignored if you're going to actually think critically. Mm. I hope that's more concrete. Not at all. But let me say this. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell's here. Um, as, as I'm processing, part of what drives me is this question, how do we get here? Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's almost like I want to back map, like, okay, all right. So people will put on some boats, but okay. So then Howard French just did this thing with Mansa Musa. Okay. So Mansa Musa's trek to Mecca made the Portuguese say, wait a minute, why are we going around this continent? or they didn't know it was continent at that time. I don't think they thought it was continent. But why are we going around this landmass to try to get to Asia when we can go into the landmass and get all of the gold that we need? Oh, and there are Black people, the people that can, artisans and farmers and look at their bodies. Oh my, okay, let's start trading them, right? That started the whole thing. But at what point did Portugal, Spain, France, Brit Great Britain, Belgium, what part did they all get together and say, OK, we're going to move as a mass of people. We're going to come together. I know we be fighting each other and we may still fight each other. We're going to fight each other again. We're going to keep fighting because that's how we get the world wars. Like the whole world wasn't involved. Just these people that fight each other. They like to, the Irish fight each other. <laughs> Northern <laughs> Ireland. They just keep fighting. But for a minute, they figured out for power's sake, we could divvy up power like massive power like who made that decision and what were these amazing africans doing that they didn't have an answer for it so it all that's like my burning question like all of these great kingdoms that literally gave the world everything that if you talk about greek anything you're talking about africa if you talk about bible anything including amen come straight from africa from the kemet egypt how did they get how did we get here to the point where we've allowed a world narrative to put the very people that created civilization on the bottom of the food chain, period. So that's kind of like, let me go backwards and then move forward and try to deconstruct and reconstruct this thing. But I'm gonna bring Peaky Blinders back in, right? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I spent the half the day crying over Tommy Shelby. I, just, I mean, literally it broke this, this, this last season broke my heart in so many ways, but I'm watching this man navigate his own morality because the rise of fascism is happening, right? So fascism, so there's communism, which we see early on in Peaky Blinders because his sister is deeply involved in the socialist movement of the time. And she's entangled and married and then has a baby with a communist and and you know at the time tommy shelby's like it's messing with my business that's all i care about is my business my business and going slicing people's faces up but at some point he has a conscience because there's a rise in this thing called fascism at the same time 
like the social and he says there's a circle politics is a circle it's a circle you know you have these you know socialists and then you have these fascists and at some point they meet because they're 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 they end up having the same meeting point. It's almost like Marcus Garvey meeting with the Klan. Do you, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, you don't like Black people. You want us gone. We want to go back to Africa. Let's just come together. Leave us alone. Let us get the hell up out of here. And then you can have your white nation. I'm good with that. Like, they met. Like, and you would think these two forces would never meet to have any kind of conversation. And I thought about the Bernie bros and the Trump people right they're very similar people who really really love i mean i'm talking about the acolytes of bernie yes, yes. a lot of them voted for trump and you're like how is that there couldn't be more diametric but they're the same because it's about the passion of the ideals that drive people and i was thinking about that today as you know i'm like we're in a place very similar to where peaky blinders was when it went off and when it you know it's like the rise of hitler and it was spreading throughout the globe like it wasn't just concentrated in germany america was involved england was involved it was like weird it could have overtaken the government here and in england like Mm -hmm. it was very close Mm -hmm. i mean you think about birth of the nation being birth of a nation being screened at the white house at some point right oh yeah oh yeah and very Woodrow Wilson said it's like writing history with lightning. It's just yes. so, so true. And, the, and those Nuremberg laws, our Jim Crow laws, the exact same. That, that's how they yes. eugenics started here in America. So you think about that and you go, huh, we're in the same bubble. January 6th gave you, you know, Proud Boys and all of these these people. And but they have very, very passionate views about what exactly? Power. It's- Power. Power, exactly. And you've put so much richness on the table. The the first thing is for me, it's about power, which means that we need to be very clear about the fact that literally anything can be used to destroy life or to affirm life. So in the example that you're giving, part of what I find to be useful for understanding when these apparently opposite poles come together. Part of what helps me understand what's going on there is the way that so often we have not understood that any kind of violence and aggression is always about putting someone back in their proper place. Anytime what we turn toward as humans, anytime what we turn toward is aggression, violence, harm, Anytime we do that, we're doing it to put somebody back in their so-called proper place. It just depends on who it is that you think needs to be in their proper place. So when you gave your examples of European nations that are warring against each other usually, but then they decide they can come together for this other goal, it's because now we have a different decision about who needs to be put in their proper place. Part of what I find useful about the example you give when it comes to world history, and again, Karen, I admit to you, whenever you go to that far back stuff, I feel like that's a Dr. Carr conversation and not a Caretha conversation. No, no, no. It's an everybody everybody conversation. Well, you're right. I just don't feel as deep in it as I know Dr. No, Carr. It, for, for me, it's not. I mean, I, no, I don't know anybody that knows as much as this man, like right now. <laughs> You know, I'm thinking Carter G. Woodson, probably. Yes, definitely. Maybe, you know, uh, I'm sure Schomburg had more books, maybe, you know, it's like, yeah, but but for right now, I think we all should be contemplating how we got here from Mm -hmm. this standpoint of like what makes me inferior to to somebody else in in the global, you know, conversation. I think we all can explore. We know that it's nonsense and it's not rooted in anything factual, but we've accepted it even in how we treat each other, even in how we treat each other. So. Why okay. do we accept that? Why do we have light skin privilege and dark? You know, why Why do we even black folk get yes. engage in this kind of anti-blackness that is destructive to us? Why do we do that? OK, so I want to take this one in two ways. The first has to do with the way that you laid everything out for us with the European nations that normally war against each other, but then came together to oppress those that they would um, declare were black and create this concept of blackness. The first thing that I wanna say about that is, again, it's about power, violence and power, but part of what I think is happening, and again, I'll use the US context because 
I think that I understand that a little bit better. For example, when it comes to coming to the United States and oppressing indigenous populations and, and, and blotting them out as much as you could, part of what happened is an erasure of indigenous religions and ideas about gender and demonizing two-spirit people and multi-gender people and making it into y'all need to look like what we claim is Christian, which is male and female and heterosexuality. So part of what I want to say about how that's linked to what you said about Europeans and the African continent is because when you don't believe that the earth belongs to you and you don't want to tame the earth and 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 rape the earth when that's not your relationship to the earth then you're not even thinking in the same terms as these colonizing Europeans who came over and did that and I think that that's part of what happens with the African continent too what you're saying about okay this this is world civilizations and so how was it possible that they would end up um, subordinated I think that that's part of how it is is that there is a certain kind of murderous level of evil and exploitation that was foreign to African cosmologies. So that's how you begin to my mind. But then as we come up to today and your question about how is it that we accept these things, I think that once again, it's about the fact that we are human just like anybody else, which means that our socialization is going to have an effect. And so when you've been reared in a society that teaches you those things, you're not automatically um, oblivious to it. It will affect you because you're human like anybody else. My being black doesn't mean that I will never be affected by ideas of colorism or anti-blackness. There's a humanity there. That also means though that we have the power to reprogram ourselves when we have the, you know, the knowledge and the community conversation to do it, which is exactly what you provide, is that community conversation to unlearn that stuff. So that's what I would say to that. Well, um, you called me flexible. Um, there would be some in my life that would argue that, but I am actually very flexible as it relates to this because I will change my mind about a thing when pre presented with evidence. Mm -hmm. Easy. I always tell Torians are so stubborn. No, present the evidence. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a different, like, it's not stubborn just for the sake of it. We're not Aries. Ha ha. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's stubbornness until you, until you give us a, a different view. And, and for me, you know, even teaching, I'm even questioning what is the university system for? Is it, am I going to further, indo I will not further indoctrinate these students. I'm not going to teach them to regurgitate something and grade them based on their ability to do what I tell them to do. I, I want mm -hmm. them to think for the whole semester. So that's why I ripped up the syllabus because the syllabus before was rooted in testing and, and great in grades and not in this discourse that I think is absolutely what you should pay for an education for to get an yes. opportunity to explore what it is that you think.